Not long ago, I joined a group of citizen scientists in Ypsilanti, Michigan, where they were counting up bug larvae to learn about the health of the Rouge River, once one of the most polluted waterways in the Great Lakes. The Rouge River winds through some of the most heavily populated and industrialized areas of Southeast Michigan. During the first half of the 20th century, factories, refineries, and other industrial facilities lie in the river's banks. Most famously, Ford's massive River Rouge complex, which was the largest integrated factory in the world when it was completed in 1928. The Rouge River became so polluted that in 1969, it caught fire, just like the Cuyahoga and nearby Cleveland and others. It was a bad time for wildlife looking to call the Rouge River home. The industry is still there, but 50 years of environmental regulations, remediation, and restoration efforts have made conditions a lot better, and aquatic life is slowly returning to some parts of the waterway. The conservation group Friends of the Rouge has helped push these changes along. Monitoring manager Sally Petrella says getting people to help is easy. We have uh, uh, a lot of people that really care about the river and want to do whatever that they, they can to, to help out the river. Today, small teams of citizen scientists are gathering at 29 locations across the Rouge's watershed to collect data about stoneflies. I'm joining this group at Superior Center Park, located near the source of the river, so far upstream from the industrial stretch of the river that where we're standing has a different name. So here we are at the Fowler Creek. So um, uh, this is a headwater stream. What does that mean exactly? So it's up at the very top of where the Rouge River starts. So just right upstream you have a wetland and not too much else. And then the river flows down, eventually connects up with the lower branch, and eventually makes it its way all the way down past Doug Island um, and to the Detroit River. I think a lot of people, when they think about the Rouge, they think of you know, the Rouge plant. This is quite a bit different up here. How does this you know, section kind of relate to what's happening downstream? A lot of people wouldn't even think that this is part of the Rouge. It's so far upstream. Um, it's a headwater stream and, you know, it has some of the, the life that will eventually, as the river becomes cleaner, will then recolonize it. Um, the headwaters are really important parts of a watershed because that's where you have a lot of small streams and wetlands that, that filter and clean the water. So it's, it's really critical. While this area of the river is healthier than the more industrial parts, According to Petrella, it's not perfect. One of the biggest problems in the Rouge uh, is all the, the stormwater pollution and the fact that we've paved over so much of the watershed that water's no longer infiltrating. And so the Rouge River is a really flashy river. So when it rains a little bit, it goes way, way up and then way, way down. And that causes a lot of erosion, makes it really difficult for stoneflies and other aquatic life uh, to exist. In fact, counting up stonefly larvae is one way to measure the health of the river and how well it supports wildlife. So all stoneflies are very sensitive. That entire order of insects uh, is very, very sensitive. They have really high needs for dissolved oxygen and they need to get their dissolved, they need to get their oxygen from the water. And so uh, they need fast moving, cold, clean water. If the water gets too warm, if it gets too polluted, you're gonna rob the oxygen out of it and they're not gonna be able to survive. Why do you do this in the winter? Uh, we do this in the winter because that's when the stoneflies are active. They're a very unique insect in that they hatch out of the streams in the dead of winter. And like a lot of insects, stoneflies begin life as larvae. Petrella and her team of citizen scientists have a few tricks for finding them. So what do we do here? Our job is to go in there and collect samples, try to find them, and um, you have to use a lot of different techniques. I'll show you first one of our main techniques. We call it the riffle dance. So get in the river, and you're gonna put your net downstream of you, and then you want to step upstream of the net and then you want to dig your toes in and just try to stir up the bugs and the critters. Because a lot of these stoneflies walk around on the stones and you want to disturb them from the stones. 
And you can see as I'm doing that, the water's kind of flowing down into the net, catching the, uh, catching the stoneflies. So do you want to try that? Yeah. Let's see you try to do some Where samples. I start? <laughs> yep. Kind of coming just, right here, maybe in this little. Yeah, yeah, that looks pretty good. Little pinch point. Mm-hmm. And just sort of. I must need to get better at the riffle dance because my net ended up full of muck and rocks. There you go. Not ideal. Okay. Now let's yeah. see if I got anything. I don't know what I've come up with. <laughs> if you want to rinse your sample, oh, we could yeah. put it up there on a tray if you want to do that. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, if you put too much muck and then your volunteers will be really mad at you. They won't be able to find anything. Fortunately, all is not lost, even with a beginner like me working the net. Well, I see you've got that big old rock there too. Yeah, maybe we'll get lucky with something on the rock. Yeah, okay, that looks pretty good. Okay, now what? Uh, let's head on up. The next step in the process takes place on land. Stonefly larvae are pretty small. Some are just about a half an inch long, or about 13 millimeters. So volunteers have to sift through each sample using tweezers. Nature-loving citizen scientists like Scott Sawicki and his daughter Sophia happily help with this dirty work. This is their 10th stonefly survey. Yeah. Have you guys seen uh, like any changes over those years since you've been as citizen scientists surveying the river, ups and downs. Ups and downs for sure. Sometimes, sometimes you know, we have a day like today where we get started and immediately are finding tons of results. Other times, you know, a, we might, might go to the same location more than once and have very different results. Um, and it's always interesting to hear from Sally and the other folks, the team leaders, what that might mean, you know, what, what those trends can, can represent. What keeps you coming back? We want to, we want to do our part to take care of the environment that we live in. Um, it's educational for her. We feel a part of a community. It's a great group of people. I'm glad you guys are coming out here and doing this, thank you. According to Petrella, the work of these citizen scientists informs the work of local governments and other organizations. When we find areas that are, you know, poor quality for benthic macroinvertebrates, um, they, that can lead to a restoration project um, being specifically designed for that area. Um, so there's that, and then, you know, the state also uses the data to help determine, you know, the health of the river and whether um, it, it is still um, impaired for certain designated uses and whether it needs more work for restoration. So it definitely has an impact. To help maintain and further improve the health of the Rouge, Petrella urges residents and lawmakers to think critically about the current rate of development in the Rouge's watershed. In this region, uh, we're, we're developing the land eight times faster than the population grows. That's very detrimental to the river to develop all that. We need to preserve more land out here to help keep our, our water quality, to help preserve our, our river. At Great Lakes Now, we aim to cover the Great Lakes region and the people who live here, like you. Please follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and sign up for our newsletter at greatlakesnow.org.